Hello, this is Danny from CG Dreams. Today I'm going to be covering the non-linear animation system within Cinema 4D using motion clips. Before I cover this topic, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the keyframes, frame rates and the basic animation principles. I've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. So first of all, let's look at the basics. For animation, we use what's called keyframes. Keyframes are denoted by this timeline, and the timeline is telling us from these numbers what frame we're on. Now, the frame we're on has some relevance to time, and the time is governed by what's called the frames per second. A video is broken down into how many still frames can fit into each second of time. All video media has its own frame rate. A common frame rate for animators is 24 frames per second. In the UK, movies and films are set at this standard, while in North America, it's 29.97 frames per second. By going to the project settings, you can see here we've got the setting for the frames per second. And as mentioned, by default, it's 30 frames per second. However, for me, it's 24. But just take a note of the timeline, what happens when I change this. You'll notice that the frames shift, and this is to make up the timing between 30 and 24 frames per second. So if it's 24 frames per second, this means that 24 frames of animation equals one second in real time. Therefore, if you was to double this to say 48, then you're gonna have two seconds of animation. And this is basically how it works. So the first thing you do is you need to set the frame rate in which your video is gonna be in. And according to where you're located or the type of video that you're gonna be creating will be governed by the frames per second. The next thing that you would need to do is to work out how many frames that you're going to need. And of course you can just simply get out the calculator and work it out based upon your frames per second. So in other words, if you needed it to last say 50 seconds or 60 seconds, you could say 60 times 24. And this will give you the number of how many frames you're gonna need for exactly one minute of animation. And of course you can make this into minutes, even hours if you had a very long animation. So let's explain a little bit about the timeline. The timeline has this little tiny scrub handle here, highlighted in green, and you can move in time through the frames. Now the frames that you see currently are set at 72 frames. And if your frame rate was default at 30, then you'll see that it says 90 frames. This means we can fit 90 frames on its default setting. Now, of course, 90 frames is not a lot, so what you would want to do is increase your frames overall for your animation. So let's say we go for 300 frames. You'll notice that even though I've changed it to 300 frames, that we can still see zero to 72 frames on the timeline. And this is all down to this slider here. This slider here is basically going to govern how many frames we're gonna see at once on our timeline. What we can do is you'll notice we've got this area here which is somewhat blank and you can scrub through this. We're still only seeing exactly 72 frames at one time, only that we're able to scrub to see a different area of the entire frame range out of that 300 frames. Now, if you wanted to see a specific frame range, you could move these little tiny handles at either end so that you could increase or decrease how many frames that we see at one time on our timeline. So for instance, if I wanted to only see 20 frames from frame zero, then I can just decrease this until it shows 20. And this makes it a little bit more easier for us so that we can then see only those frames highlighted in there. In this particular case, we've got the minimum of 24 frames per second so that we're seeing exactly one second of animation in this area. Let's just expand this a little bit. 
you'll notice that as we expand it and we show more frames within the timeline that it's going to basically only show a larger jump of the frame range. In other words, you can see it's jumping from 0 to 16 to 32, 48, 64. And you take this down, you can see that it's able to break it down into less finer increments. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. This is a way in which we can then scrub through our timeline and view specific frames that we want to be locating visually in front of us at one time. So now that I've explained something about frame rates and about the timeline, what about making an animation? Now the first thing that people would normally do when they're teaching animation is to bring a sphere or a cube into the scene because it's the most simplest thing that you can do. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring in a sphere and I'm going to make it editable and we're going to make it so we can see the wireframe. And the reason why I'm going to do this is so it allows you to see the movement if you're going to be rotating this. So the way animation works is that we set a key down and what the key does is it takes a snapshot of the position, the scale and the rotation of the object. This can be the object that you've selected here, it could be a joint, it could be a null, it can be pretty much anything including parameters that you will see in the right hand side here. So for instance if you see anything here which has got this little tiny button like interface it means it's keyable. When you click on this it will turn red to tell us that it's a key has been added to the timeline specifically for this function. This means that pretty much anything with inside Cinema 4D can be animated, whether it be a material attribute or whether it be the object itself which has been animated. For now we're going to keep things quite simple and we're going to set manual keyframes. So with the object selected I'm going to click on this little tiny button here which is the shortcut F9 and it sets a key. You'll notice that a little tiny blue box has been added and when I click on it it gets highlighted orange. This means that it's currently selected. This key has basically created a snapshot of the current position, scale and rotation of the object. If I now move in time to say 20 frames, I can now move the object and then I can key it again. Now you'll notice that I've got a second key that I can select. If we now get the play header and move this, you'll notice now that we've got an animation occurring. What you also notice is we've got this motion path curve in the viewport. This is a good way for us to see where the animation is coming from and going to and the particular path in which it's going to be following. What you also notice is you'll see these little tiny dots that are going along the motion curve and this is telling us how fast it's going to be moving from position A to position B. In this particular case you can see that through the center point here that they're quite a far distance from each other these individual dots but as we get towards the end these dots bunch up to clever more. Now what this is telling me is that this is a different type of interpolation as to straightforward from A to B going at the same speed. In order to see what type of interpolation this is in the way that it's going to get from position A to B, we can select a keyframe and then you'll see here that we've got this area here called interpolation. You'll see that what's currently selected by default is spline. Spline is the most common interpolation that gets used. And typically what happens is, is rather than the animation starting from A and then ending at B point and going through it at the same speed, what it would tend to do is it would tend to ease in, get into its animation and then it will ease back out again in the speed in which it goes. So in other words, when you play this back, it won't just go from here to here or in one continuous speed. If I was to play this back, you see right at the very end it slows down.
Now I'm going to be looking a bit more deeper into curves a little bit later on, but I just wanted to cover the basics of animation just so we can get part this, past this particular point. What you also notice is that this motion path you can click on this little tiny end here and you can move it. This means that you can stretch the animation longer or shorter. I'll just show you the result of this. So it's still going to stick from frame 0 to 20. Now it may appear this way, but in fact what's actually happening is, is even though at frame 20 it's getting from A to B, it is actually going further away than it did originally. So in order for this to happen, it means it has to be moving faster between the frame of 0 and 20. This is so that it still ends up right here at frame 20. Let's move this even further. You see this time now I've moved it even further you'll notice that because it's got further to go between this position and that position that it's having to move faster in order to get to the end at keyframe number 20. So essentially what we're doing is we're playing with time. Even though we're restricting it to move from position A to B within 20 frames we're telling the animation that it's actually got to go a long distance within this keyframe range. In order to get there, it means you've got to go faster. This would be much like somebody saying to you, you've got 20 seconds to get from upstairs in your house, downstairs to the front door. And you could think, okay, I could make that. But if somebody was to say, you've got 20 seconds to get from upstairs in your house to the shops, then in order to do it in 20 seconds, you're going to have to do it significantly faster. And this is basically exactly what's happening in here. The frame range is to determine in how long it's going to be taking, but depending on what you want done within that frame range is to how fast it's going to be completing it. Let's bring this back down. Much shorter. Now we've got to go from one point to the other, which isn't too far away. And we've got 20 frames to get there. Therefore, this ball can take its time. Now moving back to the interpolations, as I mentioned before, the basic one is a spline. This means that it's got a more natural feel to it, the way that something starts moving, gets into its top speed, and then slows down right at the end. It effectively eases in, moves to its constant speed, and then it eases out at the end. What we can do is we can change the interpolation types. We change it to linear. It's literally going to go from point A to B in exactly the same time frame. If we were to change this to step, you'll notice that all the intermediate points in between it will skip and it will literally just jump from one to the other. You notice that all the incrementing little dots are gone and now when you play it, it will just jump. As soon as it hits frame 20, it will jump. So the interpolation is what's going to happen between position A and B. Let's put this back to spline and now we've got an indication of whether it's going to be easing out, speeding up or slowing down at the end. So 
So that's finish off this short chapter on the basics of animation just by doing one. Before I'm going to make this animation, I'm going to make a note of its position and its rotation. You'll notice that the values here are zeroed off. This means that this is its default position. And this is something very, very important, especially when you're building more complex animations, such as character animations. You will always have a default position in which you would say that this is where it's starting from. And in this particular case, this object's position in X, Y, and Z position and in its rotation position is right here. You can know this because it's all zeroed out. However, if you wanted to move this into a completely different position and then decide that this is where we want to start from, and then you could say to yourself, well, do you know what? I want it to be moved 400 centimeters from here. Well, you're going to have to start adding that centimeters to the figure that's already been shown up here because you've already moved it once. To get around this problem, what we do is we zero off the animation. Or so we say we zero off the values of the object. And this is done by selecting the object. We go to chords and you can see here that we've got this button called freeze all. Now we can choose to freeze only the position without the rotation or indeed the scale. I'm going to choose freeze all. And you'll notice now that the values are now being zeroed off. What this essentially means is that if this is becoming my default position right here, I can now choose to move this exactly to the position that I want without having to try and work out how much I've got to add to the current figure after moving it the first time. So now I can type in say 300 centimeters and it's going to move exactly 300 centimeters. So the idea is that when we start our animation, we want everything to be zeroed out so that if we wanted to return to its original position, we can do so by simply zeroing out of these keys, the X, Y, and Z, or the rotations. Another way that we can zero this out quickly is to go to the character menu. We go to commands and you can see here, reset PSR. That stands for position, scale, and rotation. This is another quick way in which you can reset your model back to its default position. This is particularly um, something that you want to do when you're setting up something complex such as a character rig. You want to make sure that all of the controllers and the joints in which the controllers are going to be moving have been zeroed out so that you can always return to its default pose position. So let's go ahead and return this back to its original position by clicking unfreeze. And then it's going to update the position that I've moved it to. And then I can just basically go and select Reset PSR. And now it's going to move back to its original position that it was in. So let's create a short animation. We're going to set a key for where it is right now. We're going to move, say, 30 frames ahead. Move to the position that we want and hit another key. I want the ball to jump in the air, like in an arc. So what I will do is I'll go somewhere between here and move it up and set a key. You'll notice now that we've got this nice arc in our visual representation of this motion curve telling us exactly the path in which it's going to be moving along. You'll notice for every single key that we add, we've got this little tiny dark sphere or bubble. And you can select this which highlights and you can move it so that you can change the type of motion path which is going to be taken. Because this is representing a key, we can also select this and change the type of interpolation. So we don't have to necessarily select the key down here. We can do it by selecting it on the actual timeline itself or on the motion path. We can set this as something like linear. And now you'll see that it's going from one position, stop straight to the other. Now we're going to be moving on to something a little bit more deeper and this is called retargeting. The idea of retargeting is that you can get a rigged figure to follow the animation of another. Basically we can retarget the animation of one rig onto another. Now the way in which we do this is we select the character that we want the animation to be applied to. 
we right click, we go to the character tag and then we select retarget. Now in the retarget field we've got source and target. We've also got this use hierarchy instead of names. This could be that the name convention is different from one rig to another but the hierarchy and the joints are exactly the same, in which case this will work fine. When the retarget system isn't fine and it doesn't work is when you've got two entirely different rigs with different amount of bones, different name conventions and what's even more important, different hierarchies to the way that the bones are actually child and grouped. In these particular circumstances the retarget will simply not work. But if you've got a character rigged such as this with this particular joint set up and you're using an animation with the same kind of rig then you can have no problems. So in this particular case where I will select my retarget tag, the source is going to be where it's coming from, which is this hip bone here, and the target is going to be where it's going to. You'll notice now that it's adopted the same kind of posture, and when we play this back, we've now successfully retargeted an animation from one rig onto another. Now in the real life application of this, the character will be bound to this particular rig that I'm kind of highlighting around now. Now as I mentioned, the limitations of retargeting within Cinema 4, 4D is that you may have a different naming convention which may not be too much of a problem, but the joint hierarchy or even the joint position is what's going to cause problems. When I say the joint position, I mean its orientation in the way each joint is actually loaded. If I were to select the spline, for instance, the spine here, you'll see here in which direction the Y is pointing, which direction the Z is pointing, and which direction the X is pointing. If you just select another joint from another rig in which the orientation is completely different, then what will happen is it will flip the skeleton basically inside out, and you have a complete mess. So let's move on to a better solution and that is to use what's called a system called Mixamo which is free online for you to use. It's a free system and it also not only gives you the compatibility between your rig systems between what's being rigged as your character and the animation itself but it will also give you a free library full of loads of animations that you can use for your character without having any fuss. In fact you don't even have to use the retarget if you didn't want to, which is the whole point and really where I'm aiming this video towards, to using the non-linear animation system. So let's go ahead and look at the Mixamo route. Before we move on to using Mixamo, there's a couple of things that I need to mention about the character and what you need to do before you go and take it to that next step. Now the model that I'm using is made by Nix and it's one of the content that is found within inside ZBrush. And what I've done with this is I've made sure that the first thing is that the character is facing the right orientation. In other words, when we look at the front view, he's facing frontwards and that he is the right scale. Also need to make sure that the Y is pointing up, that the Z axis is pointing backwards and that the X axis is pointing to the right. This will then confine to the standards of what is used for Mixamo. Another thing is regarding its scale, you need to make sure that you're working within real world scale because the lighting system within Cinema 4D and the, um, the material system always works on the basis of real world values for real physical properties. And in order for us to work within this, we need to make sure the character is within realistic bounds of the scale. When I originally bought this in, this was 188 meters tall, and it should be 188 centimeters. So one of the things that I did is I selected the Y axis, which indicates how high the character is when I've got it selected. I'll copy this, go to edit, go to scale project. And then in here, we will paste in the value of the height and then we will paste in the value of the height that we want it to go to. So this could be something like that to start with. And we want it to be to that. We click OK and then the whole scene is being rescaled. 
Once we do this, we can then export the OBJ file ready for Mixamo. When we log into our Adobe account, which will be a free account, you don't have to pay for this service, you'll then move on swiftly to clicking on the upload character button, which you can see here. I'm going to drag and drop my Mixamo ready object and it's going to upload. What we're doing here is we are allowing the service Mixamo to auto rig the character for us. What we should be seeing is the character facing forwards. We can then go next and then place these markers in the respective places like the chin, the wrist, the elbows, knees and the groin. When we've done with this we click on next and with that Mixamo use its really cool logarithms to create a nice bound character for us. Now there's nothing stopping you from bringing this into Cinema 4D and making some alterations to it. In other words you can refine the skinning process with weight painting to make it deform even better than what Mixamo does. But on the whole Mixamo does quite a good job. We click on next and next. Now one of the first things that I like to do is download the character exactly the way it is in its basic stance. Or what you can do is you can type in T-Pose in the search and you'll find a T-Pose stance. This is another ideal way of bringing in a character at its T-Pose or basic stance. The reason why you would want to have this is it allows you to do some weighting in symmetry if you wanted to alter anything. It's also really a good basis to start your character from so that you can eventually, if you wanted to, add controllers to the rig and make it more personal. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to download this version of the character. And for simplicity purposes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show you, if I click on the T-Pose, it's going to put the character into the T-Pose and then we can then move on from there. What we then do is we click on download. We can download with the skin and the FBX format is absolutely fine and we click on download. Once we downloaded this we can then merge it into our scene or we can start a fresh scene if we wanted to. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you this. I'm going to drag and drop my T-Pose character. Make sure that geometry is selected if it's not. And then you'll notice now that you've got the character brought into the scene. And the character should have all of its bones in place. And you should be able to apply some animation to this. Hopping back over into Mixamo, you can then choose all of the animations that you want. So for instance, I want an idle. Download an idle. I will want a walk. Now the type of walk that you want if you wanted to create your own path would be the in place. This is so that we can add our own path with a spline later on using a line to spline and we can be specific in where, where he actually walks. When you're using this kind of walk where it's already moving in space you pretty much have to let him walk in the direction that he wants to walk in. You can of course direct and change his path by just rotating in where he's walking but it's not quite as fluid and nice as if you use an align to spline. So I'm going to download a in place walk and I'm also going to download an in place run. You can choose which one you want. Mine's going to be in place. Another thing you may want to take notice of as well 
is the foot in which the character's moving off from. So if you have any intentions of using the non-linear animation system within Cinema 4D, which we'll be looking at soon, it's a good idea to plan ahead and think to yourself, am I going to get this character to go from a walk sequence into a run sequence? If that's the case, it's a good idea to have a look where he's starting his foot off from. You notice that if you click on the mirror, you can start his foot off from a different foot. So if you can, you want to make sure that your run and your walk has got the same foot in which he's pushing off from. This is going to make things a lot more easier for later on. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at the nonlinear animation, also known as NLA. And in Cinema 4D, it's called motion clips, in which it's derived from. So the motion clips within Cinema 4D allows you to basically to construct a whole sequence of animations from different individual clips and then combine them, merge them and streamline them to be smooth in its transition between one animation clip and another so that it looks like it's one whole composite. So what can you do with motion clips? Let's just run down a few things that we can do with them. We can convert keyframe animation to clips, motion clips. We can either keep the original keyframes in place or we can delete those keyframes and it can be put into a motion clip. We can move animation using pivot points without affecting the animation itself. We can con composite multiple clips on a single layer, which I will show you. We can composite multiple clips on multiple layers. We can transition between one clip and another. We can speed up and slow down any clip animation with ease. We can merge multiple clips into one single clip. We can convert single or multiple clips into keyframes again. And we can convert multiple clips to new motion clips to use for later use. Along with that, we can save and load single and multiple motion clip sets for use with later on. So we've got a lot of scope to cover in the ch next chapter and this chapter. In order for us to make a motion clip, we have to make sure that whatever we're going to be using for a motion clip has some keyframe animation on it already. So in this example here, you see there's no keyframes on this object. So I'm going to make a couple here. Let's move this in space. And we'll just have a an arc in that. So now we've got at least three keyframes in there. What I can do is I can then go up to the animation tab. We select add motion clips and in this we've got a few settings that we can apply. The first thing is, is we need to give it a name. I'm going to call this ball jump. The next thing is you'll notice that you can choose where you want your start and end frames to be. In our particular case, we've got start frames between zero and frame 60. So it's automatically put that in there for us. However, if you had multiple animations on the single timeline, what you can do is you can split these up into individual motion clips. So in other words, if between frames zero and 60, he'd done a jump, and in between 61 and 69, for instance, he done a walk, you could first of all select the first range between 0 and 60, and then make another clip doing the same procedure as what we're doing now. So for our case, we've got a single motion between 0 and frame 60, so that's fine. We want it to create a motion clip automatically. The break expressions is only applicable if we're going to be using expressions. That's for more complicated stuff. So we leave this as it is. 
Remove included animation from original object means that the keyframes that are currently there at the moment will be removed from the original object and placed into a motion clip where you can still have access to those keyframes. By doing this, it frees you up to make a brand new animation in the same keyframe range where it was before. The next thing is, is to create pictures. This is going to create automatic pictures for you to get some kind of visual clue as to what the clips are about. Also in relation to the name as well. Now the position, the rotation and parameters are there on by default. You can choose what kind of data that you want to be included. So for instance, we're more likely to be using the position and rotation more than anything else. But if you think that you're going to be applying some of these other attributes later on, well, you can also have these turned on as well. It won't harm anything at all. We click OK. And the first thing you'll notice is the keyframes will disappear. When the keyframes disappear, this means that the motion clip has been created. Now, when we go up to the object, you'll notice that we've got this tag on here and it's the motion system expression for motion clips. Now in my particular case you can see it hasn't removed the keyframes so it's likely that I didn't have the option turned on. Sometimes when you're applying it to an object and not to a rig this can happen. So let's remove this again. You can still clearly see that we've got the keyframes there but in actual fact, the keyframes are doing nothing. So it did actually do what we expected. It just didn't update the scene to show it. Now, while we scrub from the beginning to end, it may seem that the keyframes that we've still got there visibly are actually running the animation. But in fact, they're not. It's the motion clip. To create a motion clip from a character rig, we always select the root, which in this particular case is the Mixamo hips. The reason why we choose the topmost hierarchy of the root is because the clip's going to include everything within that hierarchy. So in other words, everything which is a child of the hip joint is going to be included in the motion clip. So to do this, we select the hip joint in our particular case. We do exactly the same thing as before. We go to animate, add motion clip. I'm going to call this walk. I want the original keys to be removed and everything else is fine by default. You do have the option here to disclude anything that is within the hierarchy originally stated. So if you didn't want the right leg, for instance, and its whole hierarchy, to do this for this to work, you hold down the control key. Once you've done this, you can click on OK. You'll notice the keys have gone and now we've got the motion still of the walk cycle but we've got no keyframes. So let's have a look a bit about what's included within the motion clip and how we can construct and use the motion clip system for the non-linear animation. Once we added the motion clip we need a way of accessing all of its controls and features and to do this there's two ways. We can select the motion click tag and then here we can click on open in TL, short for timeline. When we click on this, you'll notice that we've got this timeline opening up and we've got the clips that are all stacked up down to the left hand side. We've got the clips in which it's going to be applied to originally. So this is the layer in which it's automatically created for us. You'll notice that the name of this is the name of which the motion clip was made for. So in other words, if you look at the hierarchy's name here, or the beginning name, you can see here it's MixamoOridge.hips. And you can see here this is exactly the same. So this is made after, the, after this. So any clips that we're going to be applying will be to this object. And then we've got the layer in which those clips are going to be put onto. Now, another way that we can access this, which is the way I prefer, is to go up to the layout and choose the animation layout. Now, by sticking to this way, you could put this to another screen, which is quite handy. 
you have got all of the options that you're going to have in the other view. If you select a clip, you can see here we've got the basic, hierarchy and advanced. And this is giving you access to the, all, all the options that you're going to have when you go to the animation layout. I prefer the animation layout because I've got everything in front of me that we're going to be showing you today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from the layout and choose animate. This way we can select on a clip. We can see the settings up here for that clip. We can see our objects list. We can also see the clips to the left hand side. We've got access to everything that we need for our animation purposes. So how do we navigate around the motion clip within this timeline area? Well, if we hold down the Alt key and right mouse button, you can move it from left to right to zoom in and out. If you hold down the Alt and middle mouse, you can pan left and right. If you press the S key, it's going to frame that particular clip on the screen here. So it's going to frame the selected clip. If you press the H, it's going to frame all of the clips that you may have on there. So if you have multiple clips, it will frame all of them. And if you were to have your timeline header handle in a different location, and we just increase our frame range here. Let's say you had it up here and you were zoomed in on here. If you press the O key, the O key will zoom straight to where your timeline position is, where the handle is here. So that's how you navigate around this area here. It's quite simple really. For the display options here, well, we've got a few things that we can change as to what gets displayed on our clip. To access this, we go to the Motion System tab and then we select Motion View. In the Motion View, we can choose to see the start, the end. You can see here we've got 31 and 0. You can choose to see the loop time when we choose to loop the clip, which I will show you later on. It will show any trimming information as well, if you want that on. You can choose to see the clip name instead of what the clip is applied to. In other words, this Mixamo rig hip. This may be more better for what we're going to be showing. So the clip name is a motion clip. We can choose no name or we can choose the source clip name. One thing that you may find quite handy to have on is the F curve in motion layer. This is handy for later on when I show you how we can transition between one layer and another in which you'll better see the F curve to adjust that. So these are a few things that you can change as to what you're going to be viewing on your motion clip. Another thing that is of use to us is if you select the motion tag, you can see here show summary path. If you've got this turned on, what you'll see is you'll see this motion path that we saw in the basics video for animation. And what will happen is, is it will show a summary path of the object with everything combined, the motion clips, pivot objects, and the blending between one motion clip and another. And this gives us a good idea of exactly how our motion's gonna be going from one to another. And this is by having the show summary path on, which is really, really good in the way that this works. Now, in our particular case, we've got this walk sequence in here. And if I just play this back, pressing the space bar, you can see here that the character is simply just walking on the spot. So how do we go about getting the character to move through 3D space? It's actually quite easy and it's very good in the way that Cinema 4D does this. And it uses what's called pivot objects. So a pivot object will be animated separately from the motion itself. So it's kept separate so that we can finally tune and adjust exactly how fast or where the character is going to be walking to. So there's two ways in which we can add a pivot object. The first way is by selecting the tag that we want the pivot object for. And then you'll notice here in the advance that we've got this create pivot. We've also got create keyed pivot. 
The difference between the two is that this one here will create a pivot object and it won't be keyframed. And this one will be keyframed in its current position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keyframe this one, the original one that I'm going to create and create that. You'll notice that we've got this new pivot object in here. I'll just go a bit closer. It gets smaller as you get closer, but you can increase its size. I'll show you how in a minute. And you'll notice that in the coordinates, we've got the position and the rotation of the pivot object automatically keyframed for us. If you had chosen the other option, just create pivot, it will not keyframe it. You have to do that manually. You also see in the timeline here that we've actually got this keyframe right at the beginning at frame naught. So this is one way that we can create a pivot object. However, you'll notice that the pivot object automatically gets created at the center point in which is the pivot's location for the object in which the motion clips have been applied to. In other words, it was the hips. So you can see here it's right at the hips. Now, it may be the case that you wanted to have this right at the feet. So what you can do is you can uncheck this and move this down to the feet. Now, what you'll find can happen when you do this is as you, as you move for the animation, it will flip back to its original location, even though you've moved it. So yet at the moment, it's not a problem, but you may find that a bit later on when you start adding some keyframes, like just then, it's automatically flipped to its original position. And then the whole character is then being moved off of its feet. So that's not ideal. The second way of adding a pivot object is the way that I prefer. And this is to make sure that nothing's selected. And we go to the animation tab, or the animate tab, we click on pivot object. You'll notice that this pivot object is created right at the feet straight away. And this is the way that I like to work because the likelihood is, is you're gonna need it at the feet when you fine tune the position between one clip and the next. So once you've got this in place, what you can do is you can select your clip, you go to your advanced tab, and I don't want any animation clip or anything on there for, as far as um, animation. So I'm just gonna right click and go animation and delete track. I don't know animation on there at all. I'm going to drag and drop this pivot object into here. And now the pivot object is going to be assigned to this clip. You can then select this pivot object and call it whatever you want. Walk one as an example. And then you can start to work with this pivot object. Now what you can also do is you can add multiple pivot objects so that you can switch between one and another. So let me just show you a good example of how we can do this. Let's say, for instance, we add another pivot object in here. And we have this maybe at this position here. I'm going to make sure that this is keyframed right here. And our original pivot object is keyframed right here. So I'm going to select this and keyframe it. Now, what you can do is you can move a pivot object in time over time so let's say when it gets to the end of this clip which happens to be frame 31 i'm going to have him move all the way over to here now, if you want it to be very precise in its snapping between one pivot object and another you can turn your snapping using the p key and make sure that you haven't got vertex but you've got axis snapping and then what you can do is you can move it and you can snap it to the next pivot point and then create a keyframe for that. Now you'll notice we've got a motion path. We've also got the movement between one pivot point and another. Now at this stage, it's got nothing to do with the second pivot object. But the reason why I put a second pivot object in there is because I wanted to show you that we can actually transition between one pivot object and another. So how do we do this? Well, we make sure that we get to the end of the last frame, which is frame 31. Then we can say on frame 32, let's just move forward here, that we want the new pivot object to take over. So to do this, we can click on our clip. You notice that we've got this here and you've got no keyframe on this at the moment. We need to make sure that we've got a keyframe on this from the beginning. This is telling us that we're using the walk pivot 
and at frame 32 I want to change it to the new pivot object so I'm going to call this walk 2 and we're going to drag and drop this in here and then we're going to keyframe it now what this means is is when we get to this precise position within our timeline it's going to switch our pivot object from one to the other you can see this as I'm just flickering over between here right here we're looking what this means is we can then get this new pivot object and start to move this and the character is now going to be following the new pivot object so what will happen is is it will take over from one to the other and this is all providing that we switch our clip between one another so it switches it in time to move it to its next position now the only reason why you cannot see this rig move is because our clip has run out of motion so in order to give it more motion what we can do is we can increase its time by dragging this handle this is going to essentially just slow it down we can shorten it which will speed it up I'm going to go through this in its own chapter and what we can also do is we can loop it and I'm just going to just show you this in action just very quickly just so that I can demonstrate how these pivot objects are taking over one from the other we will go through all the looping options a bit later on so what you're going to see happen is this character is going to walk with its current pivot object and then when it gets to this keyframe this pivot object is going to take over and move it to a new location okay so this is one way that we can use a pivot object now if it is the case that you go down this route of using multiple pivot objects you would want to make a distinction between one pivot object and another and the best way to do this is to change the color of your pivot object from the basic tab what we can do is we can slip the pivot object go to use color turn it on and then we can change the color of our pivot object so that it has got a different color to the previous one this gives you a good indication of when you're moving between one and the next what you can also do with your pivot object is you can choose um, the scale of your object which is another thing which you may want to do because it may be a little bit too small this is done in the objects tab you can just make it a little bit bigger so that you can see it more easier one of the things that you may want to do when you've got a walk cycle in motion in other words a type of walk cycle which moves in space as you can see this one here is you may want to have it automatically continue and loop and walk on further to do this we need to make sure that we've got the clip selected we go to the basic tab and we select this loops area here and then we increase the amount of loops that we want now by default each time it gets to the end of the loop it's going to go back to its original position again and keep on doing this which is fine for some things but for a walk path we want to make sure that he continues from where he left off and to do this we need to just check this relative loops and then you continue to walk on and on and on so let's just play that back as you can see there now when it comes to a walk on the spot motion it's slightly different as to what you have to do with this and there's a few gotchas which I'm going to be showing you so let's get this walk and we drag the clip from the left hand side into the clip area of our layer we can move this just to the beginning and then we notice that when we play this back then he's going to walk on the spot again the same thing we can select this and choose to loop it let's say we loop this three times or four now there's no point choosing relative loop because he's not actually moving anywhere so we can get him to continue to walk loop 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 but we need to get him to move so one obvious way to get him to move which we've already covered is to add a pivot object so I'm going to do just that I'm going to go to my animate tab select pivot object I'm going to make sure that with the clip selected in the advanced tab I drag and drop the pivot object into there and then I'm going to immediately 
keyframe it. At the end of the walk cycle, which would be up here, 159 frames, I'm going to have it so he's walked, say, over to here. And then I'm going to keyframe it. Now what you'll notice is, is that when you scrub through this, you'll notice that his feet will be sliding. And this would indicate that either he's not walking far enough for the speed of his feet, or the speed of the animation is too fast. You need to choose which one's more of a priority. So if, if it's imperative that he walks no further than the path that we've set at keyframe 59, let's say it has to be no further than this, then what you need to do is you need to alter the speed in which he's walking. If, however, you can say, do you know what, it doesn't matter if I move him a little bit further on, then you can adjust the position of your pivot object so that it matches up with the speed in which his feet's moving so it doesn't look as though he's sliding on ice. Because I've decided to go in favour of the position, in other words I don't want him to walk any further than this, I would have to relatively adjust the speed of the clip so that it fits within the speed for the distance he's going to be covering. So let's go back and we just scrub through this and we just look at his feet so he's walking way too fast for the distance that we're going. Now, before we move on to adjusting the speed of his feet, there's something that is going to catch you out if you're not already aware of it. And that is the interpolation of the keyframes. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, when you keyframe something, the default interpolation is set to spline. And what this means, if you look at this interpolation, is that it starts off um, slow, it will move on to its full speed and at the end it will go slow again as you can see here. These little tiny dots are bunching up together. This is indicating that this is the case. If it's crucial that you don't want your feet to be sliding along the floor at any point during the whole of the walk cycle, you need to make sure that you turn on linear for its interpolation type. So we're going to select the interpolation and turn it to linear. We do exactly the same for the end, so it doesn't slow down at the end or anything like that. Make sure that's linear. Now he's going to work at a consistent speed. Now we can start to adjust exactly how fast he's going to be walking for this distance. In this particular case, you can clearly see that he's walking way quicker than the distance he's covering. So what we can do is we can drag this out so it slows it down. Now what's going to happen is he's still going to achieve the same distance, but he's going to walk slower, less steps in that, in that distance. And there we go, that's much, much better. And we can continue to shift this until we've got it just right. Now if you didn't want to slow his walk cycle down and keep it at the same speed, as I mentioned before, you would have to increase the distance of the pivot point in which he's going to be walking. Or move the keyframe so it's going to be lasting over a longer period of time. This is so it will basically help slow the animation down or speed it up. So you've got two of those options. Just to show you the other option again um, in practice, that's keep this at its original speed. We'll, we'll move it to 100%, which is there. You can see here 100% there. And his feet will be sliding along there as it is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the keyframe of the pivot object and I'm going to move it. And you see here what it's doing, the way it's shifting things. We want it to last over a longer period of time or a shorter period of time. We just do the extreme one to the other, yeah. Okay. It's even worse. So we do the opposite way. And we play that back. That's looking much better. And you're still going to stop at the same point. The other way that in which you can do it without changing where you want the keyframe to be in time, and that's just move this back to where it was originally, is to simply increase where this is going to be. So that's just delete this. We don't want to delete the P or pivot object, only the keyframe. So that's just delete the keyframe. What I'm going to choose is I'm going to choose for him to be walking a shorter distance. So 
to say between here, right at the end of the walk sequence, 159, I want him to walk a shorter distance and it's going to be more in tune as to the speed of his feet or his footsteps. So that's going to now add a keyframe. See, he's walking way, way too fast. So that's go to the end. Move them back to there and just keyframe that there. You can see here, this is the opposite effect. He's walking slower. So what we can do is we can just adjust how far we wanted to walk. But in reality, when you're actually working with a real scene, you're likely going to be saying to yourself, I want the character to walk from this position exactly to this position in which you would use the latter um, methods that I used in order to either increase the speed of his walks or decrease the speed of his walks according to the range in which he's got to walk. And of course, as to how long he gets there is always determined by the keyframes that you're going to be covering. So in other words, if you said, I want him to get from A to B, whatever that may be, in say, four seconds or five seconds you go 24 frames if it's 24 frames per second that that's one second we've got 48 is 48 and then you would keep on moving it up and up and up and up until you've got your seconds that you want and then you add a keyframe so then you've already chosen exactly the distance that he's going to be covering and you've chosen how long you want him to take to get there when you've got those two in place, which is the way you're likely going to be doing it, then you simply just drag this so that he's either walking slower or faster according to the distance and the time it takes to get there. Now, one problem with this is that even though we're getting him to walk over this area, and I'm going to just rectify this. Okay, I'm going to move him say this is where I want it to be. Let's just rectify this. And let's just get the speed right. That's not too bad. That will do. Okay. One problem is that you'll find is if you wanted to do something like a slow motion in between here, well, you can't do it because you can see here, when I hover over this, you've got these little tiny slices here. These slices are indicating the loops where it's looping from one to the next. And... What this means is, is that the first loop is literally the actual animation and any successive loop after that isn't really part of the motion itself. It's just a replica of the first one. You could say it's like a ghost of the first one. This means that you can't slice this up and this is still a feature that I'm yet to explain and show you how to slice things up. But just to show you quickly, if we right click and choose cut, you'll find that you have got this no access sign here, which is saying you can't cut it. You can cut it within the original keyframe area or the motion area, but you can't do it within here. So in order to do this, you have to go through a process of baking things down. And this is something that I'm going to show you as part of this workflow, but I've got a few things I want to show you before this. Up until this point, I'm kind of really focusing more on how you can use the loop function here between a, a static walk on the spot and a walk in motion. So for now, I'm going to just remove this walk cycle and I'm going to just add this walk in motion and I'm going to show you what you can do with the slicing. We've got this walk in motion and what I want to happen is, is somewhere in between here, I want it to slow down. This could be like bullet time and this is where you could merge it between say one motion clip and another what i'm going to do is i'm just going to zoom in a little bit with the alt and the right mouse button just to zoom in and i'm going to say at around about frame 50 i want to cut it there i'm going to right click and i'm going to select the cut option if you just click here you'll better cut it and you can better cut it anywhere you want along here and as mentioned the only exception to this is you can't cut something which has been looped 
so I'll show you how to get around this in a minute. In order to disable the cut, you have to right click and select it again, and then it's basically deselected it. What you can then do is you can then grab this clip as an example and then drag it out so that it becomes slower over time. And then you can have the previous clip where it continued on from to kind of continue that bullet time. Now when we play this back, he's going to get to that frame and then go slow-mo and then continue to walk fast again. So this is something that you can do with your clips. You can slice them up. Now another way in which we can use this cut tool is to do as follows. If we want to connect it back, what we can do is we can drag from one clip to the other and then what it will do is it will enable you to connect it back to where it originally was from and it will create a brand new motion source for us. You can see here that the motion source which is underneath this I'll just move this it's still there let's just zoom out of this that's the clipped version and this is the version that hasn't been clipped now in order for you to use this other cut feature here you can use the hotkeys control and shift and let's just show you how this works if you press the control key and click anything before it is going to be deleted if you hold down the shift key and click anything after it is going to be deleted and just simply because clicking will enable you to basically slice wherever you want and as mentioned before you can just drag from one to the other with your mouse belt button held down and then it will basically merge it back together again and this is all from this cut connect object Now earlier on I briefly touched on a little tiny problem that you may come across when you're using a walk on the spot motion which is driven by a pivot object in that you can't slice up the repeated loops. So how do you get around this issue? Well what you can do is you can convert this and bake this down to be one brand new motion clip. So in other words it will grab all of the repetitions of loops and then make it so it is actually a brand new clip which contains all of the walk cycle needed to get from position A to B without having to use the loop feature. At the moment you'll notice when I select the clip that we've got the loops here and it says free. We want this to be all incorporated into the same clip. Now if you want to keep the pivot object, the original pivot object in place and still drive it that's absolutely fine. But at this stage what we can't do is right click and select the cut or connect tool and then cut or connect it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this and if you go to the motion system you can see here this option that says bake clips. And when I do this you'll notice a brand new clip gets added to our timeline which is here and you'll notice that it adds it down here as well. And we can rename this to walk loop free because it was a loop of free just so we know what it is that we're dealing with I'm going to delete these other ones here so we can see what we're working with and what will happen now is he will still continue to walk we just have to reassign the pivot object again go to the advanced we drag and drop the pivot object that was moving it in the first place and now you can see he's walking as he did before. The difference now is, is that when I go to the basic tab, you'll notice that it says loops none. This means that this is one continuous clip incorporated all of those three loops that were in it. And now we can use the cut and connect and slice it anywhere along here. So we can slice it here and here. We can choose to then manipulate if we go slow-mo and then go back to normal speed again. So that's how you get around with the problem of having looped walk-on-the-spot animations 
and to be able to go in there and still use your slice tool. Now you may have noticed that when I was scrubbing through the animation over this area here which was time stretched that the limbs were starting to rotate in very odd ways. The reason for this is normally down to a setting for the motion tag itself which is to do with mixing rotation. If we select this you'll notice that it's set to auto for the mixing rotation. Now what can happen is, is it can cause problems with this so what you need to do is change it from one of the other two that is available. I find that the HPB is the one that normally fixes the issue. So if you have this issue with the limbs rotating very odd after baking, this is normally the cause. To really emphasize on this point, I'm gonna show you in another scene where it's more evident. So I've got a scene here in which I've got an original walk-in sequence, and I'm just gonna drag and drop it into here. This needs to be looped a number of times, so I'm gonna do this right now. And then the next thing is, is I'm going to assign it to a pivot object so that it can move it. So that's just assign this. And now, of course, it's going to go and walk along the uh, align to spline, which I'm going to be showing you in the next chapter. Now, what I need to do is I need to be able to edit this. So as before, I'm going to bake it down and I'm going to just highlight one of the problems that you're going to have if you choose the wrong type of rotation mixing. At the moment it's left to automatic. So I'm gonna select the clip, I'm gonna to go to the motion system and click on bake clips. And that's just tidy this scene up. I'm gonna call this baked for this layer. Now, when you're going through it in real time, I'm gonna just assign this pivot back to it you're not going to notice really any problems. This is because the flipping of the limbs is so fast in real time that you actually don't even see it until you slow down the animation. So if you have any, any intentions of doing a bullet time slowdown, you may have this problem and not be aware of it until you actually start to do this bullet time slowdown. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to increase my frame range and then I'm going to drag this almost double the distance so that it slows it down and when you play it back you'll notice that these limbs start to go in very odd positions there's one such instance now because we're looking at the right leg in this particular case we can quickly go to where the problem is to highlight it so to do this i'm just going to right click and then click on show f curve in f curve mode and you've got all of these keys. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just highlight on that left or right leg. It's the right leg, so I'm gonna select the upper right leg only, and it's on the bank of rotation. And I'm gonna to go to the F curve menu and click on show all tracks. And what it's gonna do is just show the track that I've got selected. And you'll notice that you've got all of these keys up here but you've also got all of these keys down here. Now, if I was to zoom in so that we can see, you can see here minus 180 degrees is where roundabouts these keys have been assigned to. Now, if you was to look on the original, you'll notice that if I was to move these up, it would look more like this. That's the way that it should be looking this curve in here but what you'll find is is that if you've got the mixing mode wrong for the rotation that it causes this problem so let's just close this down and then we'll do it the way it should be done so let's delete this baked version we will go through the same scenario again but this time I'm going to choose a different mixing mode so we're gonna repeat it a number of times as before and I'm also going to be assigning the pivot object as before. This time I'm going to go to the motion tag and change it from automatic to HPB. Now this time I'm going to do the same thing I'm going to go and bake the clip 
and I'm just going to call this baked version 2 and what you'll find is we haven't got the same issue we can now if we want to that's just slice it there as a good example here let's slice it here we will just delete this and we will time stretch it out so it's playing much slower now you'll notice now that there is no issues with the animation and to demonstrate this again I'm going to go to the F curve mode and these are the keys right at the top here that are responsible for the legs and of course we can go and focus on these and you'll notice that we've got nice smooth keys and this is all down to the mixing mode for the motion tag in the last chapter I showed you how you can bake a clip down so that we can use this to do further editing now I'm going to be showing you other ways you can convert a clip for different features and functions. The next thing I'm going to be showing you is how to convert a clip down to what's called a motion source clip. So to do this we select all of the clips that we want. If we right click we've got this convert motion clip to motion source. Now when I select this I want you to notice what happens both in the timeline and what happens to the left here where the clips are. You'll notice that nothing has happened to the clips unlike with the bake command. In other words it's kept everything the way it is. However when you look inside the clip area here you can see here that it's created a brand new clip for us. Now that's just delete what we've got here and show you what this is. If we drag and drop this on there you'll see that it's actually a combined set of clips from the previous sliced up clips with exactly the same animation. The difference is, is it's combined all of those down for us. So again we can select this clip, we go to the advanced and drag our pivot object into there. Now it may be the case that you don't want to keep on reusing this pivot object and that you want the pivot motion to be included inside the motion. So this is how we go about doing this. We need to make sure that the pivot object itself is actually made into a motion clip itself so that we can then crush it all down into one. So how do we do this? What we do is we select the pivot object, we can go to the motion system and we can add a motion clip right here. You can also do it in the same location as before, add motion clip. I'll call this, call this pivot and then what it will do is it will create a brand new pivot motion for us. Now you notice here that we've got nowhere to put this pivot motion. We need to have it alongside this rather than over the top of it. So in order to do this we have to create a layer. And to create a layer we select the group object up top here, right click and then click on add motion layer. With a new layer we can now get the pivot object and place it below. Now what will happen is, is when we play this back it will still go through the same motion as it did before from beginning to end but the difference is is that when we go to select all of this lot and then we go to bake it down it's going to include the pivot motion within inside the actual object's bake. So I'll just show you this. We will grab all of these, we go to the motion system and we will bake it. You notice now that it becomes one clip and now it goes through the motion. The difference is, is this clip when you go to look at the advanced tab the pivot point itself is not included. So now what we can do is we can be free from the pivot object. It will still walk in motion and in time. Now it can be the case that you've got loads and loads of layers 
or loads and loads of motion clips that are stacking up. So I'm just going to drag a few on here just to demonstrate this. I have to say we've got these motion clips stacking up. And let's say that we've got a few on another layer as well. And I'll show you about the layering system in a minute. But I'm just going to add a layer for now. Let's just say we've got, it's going to create some funny, funky um, animation on there for us. Let's say we're really stacking it up and we're getting loads and loads of layers and things are just getting too complex. And we're already very settled to what we want. There is a way to group everything so that it becomes one clip, but it's actually within a group. And to do this, what we can do is we can select all of our objects. It doesn't matter even if they're on separate layers and we can create what's called a compound clip. We can right click and we click on add compound clip. You'll notice now that it's created a brand new layer for us automatically and it's compound all of the clips that we selected onto just one clip. And the animation is still going to be on this compound clip. The difference being is, is now is we can go ahead and start to layer other clips underneath this. And start to build us up another complex set of clips. And in turn, we can select all of these clips, right click, and then add to compound. And then it's going to compound all of those clips down. Now, obviously, it's going to create a bit of a mess to the rig for the way that I just did it because I haven't been using some other features that you need to know about. But this is basically how you can compound a clip down so that you've got all of your motions into one place. Now you see me a few times add layers and just to really show you how to use the layer system and a new tool, I'm going to select the root, right click and click on add motion layer. Now adding motion layer allows you to literally get another animation and come away from the animation that you've currently got on layer one, go to the new animation and then come back to it using the transition tool. You can also layer animations that do belong with each other that mix well. And this may not be always the case, so you have to use a transition. Now, there's different types of layering that I'm going to be talking about. And the layering that I'm going to be using in this particular case is going to be from the multiple layers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just drag and drop this idle motion. And you'll notice that when they're both together, that it doesn't work so well. They're kind of conflicting. So what we need to do is we need to transition at any time point during the animation between one layer and another. And that's to show you how to do this. We right click, we click on make transition, and then we just literally drag from where we're coming from to. And now what you'll notice is he's walking, he goes into an idle, and then he starts walking again. And this gives you an idea of what you can do with the motion system with the nonlinear animation. You can really get a lot of combinations of different walks and cycles and sequences. And the whole point of using the layer system is that you can get it to change animations midpoint in an animation. So in addition to this, you can also grab clips and you can move them from its current layer onto the layer in which it's already come from. I'll just show you how to do this as well. So we've got two layers and we've just drag and dropped it onto another layer. If we hold the shift key, we can drag and drop it onto the other layer. Now the difference is with this is that we can use this rather than having midpoint, we can choose to have this to crossfade into a different type of animation at this particular part of the animation. So the advantages here is when you're using different layers is you can choose where during the other sequence of animations, you're interrupting it. When you're doing it this way, you can choose where on the end of the animation it changes to a new one. And by default, when we so far have been using this, I've been dragging to the end of the previous clip. What you can do is you can crossfade it by simply just moving it over where the other clip ends. And what it will do is it will create a crossfade between one clip and another. You'll notice here that the characters going from a walk into an idle pose. So we've got a walk into an idle pose. 
And this is all by creating this automatic transition by moving it over like this. Now, when you're doing this, you want to make sure that you understand where your animation was located, its feet were located on its last keyframe and where it's going to be going to. So what I like to do is I like to just have a look and see what the last keyframe was like and just take a look at the feet. You notice that it's his right foot that all of the weight is on. What I like, what I then like to do, is I like to find a previous. If I'm going to be doing the, the crossfade in, is to look at the beginning of the next frame. You can see that his foot is all the way on his left. And what you can do is you can just go and look for a pose which is matching very similar to where this one starts. So let's have a look. This will be the closest. And then what this will do is it gives me an indication of a good place to do the crossfade. And then when I drag this into here to that location, it's going to be smoother in the way that it goes into a crossfade. Now I will touch about the timing of things a little bit later on, but this gives you an idea of what you can do with this crossfading. It's very, very helpful. Now just moving back to our other layer, just to show you what we did before, we used our transition tool from one to the other. Now you can see here we've got these curves and these curves are automatically made for us where it's basically fading the strength of one out to the strength of the other one in. And we can see this very clearly when we scrub our timeline. We'll just move here. You can see here the layer 15 is 100% and layer 17 is 0%. And as we just go across here, you can see it's cross fading between one and another. Now, whenever you've got this happening, you can go in there and actually adjust how it's cross fading with these curves. In order to do this, first of all, you need to make sure that in the motion system motion view, you've got this option checked F curve in motion layer. When you've got this checked, what you can do is you can expand the motion layers and you can grab these curves to change the transitions to how you want them to be. In addition to this, if you don't want to create an automated transition, I'll just go back a few steps, you can create a manual one. And I'll just show you how this is done. We can go to this keyframe here and we want to create a key where it says 100%. We hold down the Alt key and you click on there and it says 100% and it's lit up red. This means a key has been added. We can then say go to frame 70 and then we can turn down its value, or we'll just type it in, zero. And then you'll notice that it's automatically created a keyframe for us automatically. You can then in turn select this one and choose that this should be 100% at this point, but at this point it should be at 0%. So it's, it's essentially doing the same thing, only that you're doing it manually. So what we can do is we can 0%, the Alt key will keyframe that. And as it gets to this key, we can say we want it to be 100% right here. And it's basically done the same thing. The only difference is, is it's given us a manual option to keyframe these so that you can create your own transitions. Now that we've done this, the other thing that I'm going to show you is how you can convert your motion clips into keyframes. And to do this, I'm just going to use the auto transition to speed things up. And then what we can do is we can select the layers that we want to convert to keyframes. I want both of the layers, so I'm holding down the control key and I'm selecting both of these layers. Obviously, you can combine these down by making a compound clip as well. And then what we can do is we can convert this to keyframes. So we go to the motion system and we select this convert layer to keyframe animation. Now you'll notice that when we scrub through this, we've got our animation put back into keyframes. If we wanted to, we can then decide to turn what we've got in keyframes back to a motion clip again. That's an option that we've got. 
The beauty about this is that not only can you just do all of the layers or maybe even a compound clip into, into um, keyframes, but you can just choose to have one layer. It could be one layer that you want just specifically to keyframes alone. So you just select one layer and then you can convert it. And it's as simple as that. So what we've looked at in here is we've looked at how we can make a compound clip, which is essentially grouping, how we can convert a clip to a motion source, which doesn't change anything on the timeline, but it creates a brand new source and combines all the clips together. We've also looked at how we can grab a clip and we can bake the clip using the bake command, which is here, bake clips. And this is very, this is a little bit different in how this one works, as you saw before, is, is then it keeps it basically on the timeline still after it's done it, rather than just adding something down to here as a clip. So there's different ways that we can convert it. And then finally, we looked at a way in which we can actually bake what we've got by how many layers we've got selected in order to um, put it back to keyframes again. And of course, this compound clip is, as I said before, it kind of groups things together so that you're able to then start to build yourself some brand new layers. And then with these new layers, you can start to build up more complexity while the original animation is still intact and in place. The next thing we might want to do is to get a running or a walking cycle which is on the spot and make it follow a specific path for your animation. And this is the workflow in order to do this. Now there's been a few problems that I've encountered when doing this and I'm going to just show you kind of what they are and how you can get around these problems. But first of all, let's go through the workflow that you have to go through in order to get the character to walk or run in a particular motion path. The first thing we want to do is make our motion path. You can use the snapping options to create a spline over a particular terrain. To keep things simple, I'm just going to go from the top view and I'm going to use the sketch spline. I'm just going to do something very rough like that. Now it's quite imperative that we make sure that the spline doesn't have any kind of interpolation that makes it speed up or slow down during the path. And what does this is having these points at different um, distances from each other. The way to get around this is make sure that you've got the intermediate point set to uniform. And then we just convert this by right clicking on the spline and then click on current state to object. We can delete the old spline and when we select the new, you'll notice that all of the points are actually perfectly uh, the same distance from each other. So that's the first thing out of the way. The next thing we need to do is we need to have a pivot object for our character. So we're going to do that as same as we've been doing before. We create a pivot object and then we assign it to our motion clip. We go to the advanced tab as we did before, assign to the motion clip. Now the pivot object is now taking control of where this rig is going to be in space. Now we need to make sure that the pivot point is aligning to the spline. Now what I need to do is I need to right click and go to Cinema 4D Tags and click on Align to Spline. Now before we go any further, we need to have this tangential um, setting turned on so that when the character is to go and follow the spline, it's going to make sure that the pivot object of which is applied to automatically rotates um, according to the Z axis. So in other words, rather than just continuing around the spline, keeping the character in the same um, orientation, it's going to rotate the character to align to the spline. The problem that we're likely to have here is that the axis is on the Z axis, which is correct but we can't choose whether it's a positive or a negative z-axis. The reason why this is a problem is because if you look at the character right where the pivot object is, you notice that the z-axis is in a negative value. In other words, it's pointing backwards, which is where it should be. 
but unfortunately the lighter spline wants to work on a positive axis so what's going to end up happening is the character is going to flip around and walk backwards. The way to get around this is to select the spline and we're in points mode at the moment. We right click and you've got the spline options. We click on reverse sequence. By doing this when we go to the align to spline and we drag this into here what you'll notice is that the pivot point snaps to the end. Now because it snapped to the end it means that it's also going to reverse the axis in which it's moving along so it's going to work in our favour. So when we turn on the tangical you'll notice um, that the pivot object is going to flip the way that it should do. Okay you see that? It's, it's flipping backwards but that doesn't matter because we're going to be working on the basis of a reverse spline so that it all works out fine. So what we can then do, we can then basically move through our position of the align to spline and you can see here that the character is going to follow it. We just need to keyframe it in opposites to where you would normally do. So you start at 0% um, at the end of your um, animation and and um, or should I say you start at 100% and finish at 0%. So the next thing is you notice that the character is not actually doing anything at this moment in time until you actually start to move it. But that's fine because we ne now need to start keyframing. But the problem is, is that the character is only walking once. You can see it's got one walk cycle. So what we have to do is we have to select this and go to the basic tab and increase our loops. Now earlier on I mentioned that there is a little bit of a problem that I've encountered and this is when I can kind of bring this up. What I would normally like to do is I would normally like to have the loops selected to how many loops I want and then select this clip, go to motion clips and then bake it down so that the loop mode is turned off and that all the loops are contained within a single click. The problem here lies in the fact that when you try to time stretch it either faster or slower it messes up the joint orientation of the rig. In other words some of the limbs will flip out. So we go to the next stage where we literally keyframe it at 100% right here and we choose how long we want him to get from here to here. I'm going to say around about 200 frames to get from one position to the other. Now I'm going to keyframe it to zero and now in this time frame he's going to run from one to the other. You'll notice that his feet are moving way too fast for the short distance he's got to get in the short amount of time. So the way to get around this is to simply make it so he's running slower. So we're essentially time stretching the animation or the, the walk sequence to be adjusted to how far he's got to go in what time frame according to the timeline. It's looking a little bit better. Because we're adjusting it to the timeline, we're having to slow down the animation. If you wanted to keep the feet moving at the same pace, you would have to have him walking a further distance or keep the same distance and increase the um, keyframe in which it's positioned between 0 and 100. So in other words, it's allowing more time for him to get to A to B or it's doing it in a far faster pace. And of course, you would have to do it in a far faster pace for you to keep the motion of the legs the way they were originally. So that's just go through this and play this back. It's looking a little bit better. We could obviously do the reverse and make it so that the distance that he needs to run is the same maybe without changing it but just change the keyframe of the position in so that he can do it in a far quicker time which would then obviously match up with the speed of his feet. Now you'll notice that around frame 200 is where it ended yet we've still got all of this to go on our clip and in this, if this is the case it simply means that the timeline between 0 and 200 is dictating how fast he's going to get there and 
the align to spline is basically telling us how short of a distance or how long of distance you've got to get there. Therefore, we don't need all of these frames. So the way that to bring this down to closer to where it's matching the speed and distance, you just simply just decrease the loops. It won't adjust the uh, actual speed of things. It will just make sure that we don't have to stretch it beyond what it needs to or, or basically loop it beyond what it needs to. So we can say that at 200 was basically where it was ending, which is there. And you can see here, it's just going off into the next loop. So we'll just leave that end tail there. Now when we play it back, he's gonna move through there accordingly. Now you'll notice that he starts off a little bit slow. This is because the interpolation in the keyframe for the align to spline that we've got here. So what we have to do is select those keys and make sure that instead of spline, they are linear. This means that he starts off at a certain speed and he ends a certain speed so that he doesn't um, alter the timing and allow his feet to slide. It'd be more consistent all the way around now. And it's still not perfect, but you, you should get the idea from this that we how we can adjust these things. And if we just, just speed it up a little bit, you see there, definitely not speeding up, so we can slow it down. Slow it down even more. That's looking better. So we've covered a lot so far, and I just want to reiterate some of the things that we've already done in the last past chapters. And then I want to move on to show you how we can get everything baked down into keyframes. Specifically, the keyframes which involve if, uh, expressions. So let's just put this together really quickly. I've got my run sequence. I want it to be looped so many times. I want to assign my pivot object, which is in turn run by a line to spline. I'm then going to watch this and just see how fast the feet are moving. They're moving way too fast, so I'm going to drag this out. That's looking better. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the motion clip for its rotation and mixing is set to HPB, which it is. By default, it's not. And then I'm going to convert this by clicking on Bake Clips. So now it allows me to slice things up a little bit. And that's just create this bullet speed. Now, before I do this, I need to just reassign my pivot object again. If you don't want to have to keep on reassigning the pivot object, you need to make sure that you bake down the pivot object along with the animation as well, so that you don't have to keep on doing this. So we got it to that point, didn't we? That's it. We'll take it back down to here. When I bake my keys, you need to make sure that you're in keyframe zero when you add your pivot object back. Otherwise, there's going to be a bit of a, a distance between where it starts. And now we've we're in a good position now to do this like bullet time. I'll do it right here between here and when he lands. Right click and disable this cut. And let's just drag this away a little bit. And we'll do our time, our time warp, you could say. So that's just, there he goes. And then he land back down. We've got to the point where we've got our basic animation done, but now we want to get this baked into keyframes. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we what we don't do is we don't select our object or our layer and go to motion and click on um, convert layer to keyframe animation. The reason why we don't is because now we're using expressions and the expression is found within the align to spline. So in order to get the align to spline baked down into keyframe animation, we go about this a slightly different way. Rather than selecting the clips and then going to the motion system and clicking on bake clips, we need to go into the dope sheet. So we go from the motion mode into the dope sheet 
And then when we go in here in the functions menu, we've got a new option here called bake objects. And this is going to give us an additional command in there when we're baking. So all we have to do is select the object that we want to bake to. And we just simply go to functions, bake objects, and make sure that expressions is turned on. We want to have create copy turned off unless you want to copy, but I want to go over the original, so I'm fine with that, and then click OK. Once you're done with this, you can then just remove your motion clips. You can remove the pivot object and the spline. And now you've got the animation and it's going on its own path. And this is the point where you can then export your animation. So as an example here, this would be a point in where you could share it with another application, another artist, and export it as an FBX file. In this last chapter, I just want to talk about some of the visual aids that you've got to use within Cinema 4D for complex setups, especially as you add more and more and more, it's gonna be very hard to keep an eye on where in certain keyframes we've got certain actions happening. For this, we can add two different things. We can have markers, which are here. We can create a marker at the current frame. And within this marker, we can choose the color of the marker and this could be related to maybe um, a pivot object that you've got in there to indicate it's the pivot object's keyframe range. Um, and for this, what you can do is you can just add some tasks to it. You can add some notes to it. And obviously you can give it a name to say uh, maybe pivot one. And then this way you're going to have somewhere that you can go straight to to know where a specific keyframe is located for you. So this is something that is quite nice to have in there. Another thing that's quite nice to have in there is the fact that when you're working with your motion clips, you're likely to be working quite close at times to be quite accurate with your um, kind of placement and cutting, etc. And the way that you can keep a memory of this specific um, zoom in and location on the timeline is to use what's called bookmarks. What you do is you add a bookmark and even though you can't see anything there, when you go back to bookmarks, you can see it's added here. Now you can manage the bookmarks in here. You can see there and you can rename this. We can say scene one as an example. And later on, what you can do is maybe go to another area where you've zoomed in, say scene two, and then you would go there and add another bookmark. And you can say this is scene two. Now, what you can do with this is you can then go to your bookmarks, click on it, and it will zoom straight to that location and area where you're working on scene one. And when you're going to go to scene two, it will go to that respectively. And this is one way that you can speed up getting to a specific location where you're working with a specific set of motion clips. So this is the end of this tutorial, but there are many other features for the motion system that I haven't covered, but that you don't really need to know right now. So it's well worth looking into these and going to the user manual to expand on your knowledge on this. Just a couple of extra things that I thought I should mention which are of use to you is the fact that even though these motion clips are representing animation, you can still get access to the keyframes. To get access to the keyframes, you can either use these here, the, the frames, or you can right click on a motion clip and you can select show in dope sheet or F frames. And then you can see all the keyframes that originally came from the motion clip. So you can see here that it's actually on the original object that you made in the first place. Well, this concludes the video tutorial on the non-linear animation system using motion clips. I hope you've learned something from this and I hope that it's intrigued you enough to look into the manual and to dig out even more features that Cinema 4D offers.